If you're listening to this podcast, that means you're listening to it in English. You know the English language, and that also means there's a very good chance you are a direct descendant of William the Conqueror. Congratulations. If you don't know him, William was the first Norman monarch of England. He reigned from 1066 until 1087 and permanently changed the Anglo-Saxon culture of England into something a little more French, but really became its own thing. Now, sadly, the fact that you're a descendant of him isn't that significant because he has hundreds of millions of them, including 50 million in America, every single U.S. president, and every single member of a European royal family. But you can see here that something big was going on with the Normans. The Normans emerge early in the 10th century. They were descendants of Vikings, and their name means Norsemen, but they disappeared from world affairs by the mid-13th century. But that time, they conquered England and also Ireland, much of Wales and part of Scotland, and also founded new kingdoms in southern Italy and Sicily, as well as a crusader state in the Holy Land and in North Africa. And even though many of them were very violent, they were adventurers, they were mercenaries, they got into a lot of religious wars, they also had an incredible ability to adapt as time and place dictated, and could sometimes rule in surprisingly religiously tolerant ways, at least for the Middle Ages, over Christians and Muslims alike. To talk about the Normans is today's guest, Trevor Raleigh. He's the author of the new book, The Normans, A History of Conquest. So in many ways, they were responsible for a permanent cultural and political legacy. And if nothing else, in this episode, you get to learn a lot more about your great, 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 great times 20 granddad. Hope you enjoyed this discussion with Trevor Rowley. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. I'm curious, as we explore the Normans, to begin with, how do they fit into the identity of modern day England? And to frame this question... A long time ago, I had a guest who talked about the 1066 conquest of England by William, and he had a number of volunteers from Brittany on his invasion fleet. Now, Brittany in France, they live on a peninsula, but they originally colonized in the 4th century because they were the predecessors of the Anglo-Saxons and they were fleeing. So these residents of Brittany in France were actually singing songs in Old Britonic as they were traveling over, if I remember correctly. And for listeners, to give an analogy, this would be as if, as European settlers were colonizing the United States, maybe some American Indians fled and went to Mexico and maintained their language. And then centuries later, they joined an invasion fleet to reconquer the United States on behalf of Mexico. So the point of me mentioning this is to show the very interesting place that Normans figure into identity. So how are they perceived by the English today? Were they outside invaders who completely changed England from its Anglo-Saxon roots, or they were restoring it to something earlier. What do you make of that? I think they're viewed in a sort of very um, different ways by different people in this country. The Normans, they actually start the British monarchy. William I is the beginning of the whole of the British monarchy, and we, and we trace our British monarchy back to it. But of course, it was a conquest, and it was a conquest by a foreign people. And as you say, they were a, a mixture. They were a mixture of Scandinavians, of French people, of Bretons, of Flandrians, a whole range of different people coming in. But they had actually blended into something which was not French and not, not uh, Breton. It was, in fact, a separate unity by 1066. They were they were, even though they had, they had mercenaries fighting for them, they were a, a fairly tightly organized structure. Now, how are they viewed in this country? Well, they're viewed, as I say, really as the beginning of our monarchy and our queen will trace her roots back to William I, not to Edward the Confessor, or even Harold II, who was the last Anglo-Saxon king. But it's really a sort of almost a, almost a boast that the last time that Britain was, or England, was conquered was uh, nearly a thousand years ago or over a thousand years ago. So in a way, it's, it, it's turned round on itself. But nonetheless, as far as your question is, how do historians view the Normans? Again, there, there's, a, there's big divisions between those historians who say, well, they didn't make that much difference. They just... They tinkered around with the Anglo-Saxon structures they found and did this, had a few, added a few French words into the English language, but not much. Other people, like myself, believe that they actually made a, a fundamental difference to the way that England was operating. Can I give you an example? What Please. The, up until 1066, most of the political contact in Britain was with Scandinavia. There had been three Scandinavian kings of 
England in the 11th century before William already. There are three uh, totally totally different cultures that, than the Normans, although well, the Normans themselves have Scandinavian roots. Put that on one side at the moment. So and the, the same year that William fought the Battle of Hastings, only a month before in the north of England, and the Harold had actually beat, beaten the Scandinavians, and that would have been one of the great of English British history had had he not lost uh, a month later at Hastings. Now, again, to cut my answer a bit shorter, what the Norman Conquest did was to pivot that axis, which previously had been looking at Scandinavia, to France, to Europe uh, in a big way. And thereafter, although the Scandinavians are important, and there are one or two frights on the whole, it is to Europe and to France that England and Britain looks from then on, as it were, right up to the present day. Well, the Normans end up all over Europe in the centuries to come, and they're prime players in the high Middle Ages, but their origins, which come before that, I think make their story all the more interesting. So can you tell me about their origins? And this is where I'm sure it gets murky and sources are questionable, and you have to bring in archaeology and other things. So tell me about their origins. The Normans really originate in a <laughs> There's a treaty in 911 called the Treaty of saint clair sur Epte, which is in Western Normandy. And at that treaty, the French king of the time grants a Norman, a Northman, a, really a Viking warlord called Rollo, he grants him a big chunk of the same valley, understanding that he will look after it and keep other Vikings out. So what he's doing is trying to create a buffer between what is the Carolingian Empire and these incoming Vikings who've been sailing merrily up the Seine and, and looting and raping and plundering as they went. And so it was a, an attempt to try and limit that activity. Um, and so Rollo, who was, he becomes Count of Rouen, which was the capital of Normandy, and he is the first of the Norman dukes. William the Conqueror can trace his ancestry directly back, about five generations back, to Rollo, when they were pagan Vikings. They were not Christian. One of the stories is that they converted on being given this chunk of land of Normandy, but it's not certain that they did. And one of the stories, again, is that on Rollo's death, he had a mass said, but also a sacrifice of half a dozen enemies just to make sure, you know, so they start off as Vikings. They become absorbed by the French population or the, the old French population of Normandy, and they create what becomes Normandy. It isn't France, and it certainly isn't Scandinavia, but it is a, a new entity called Normandy, a duchy which becomes very, very powerful just by very skillful politics, very skillful military and just generally playing things to extremely well, ending up with someone like William the Conqueror, who is, a, is an immensely important character in Northern Europe, even before he comes across to England, because he, he's really subdued everybody around him, all the small principalities who are a danger to him. And he, he got those under his thumb by 1066. And he then, through what is a, a rather curious Link thinks he has the right to the throne of England, and he assembles a massive army, and as you said, consisting of all sorts of different people from Northern Europe and, and beyond. There were some Spanish in there as well. And he, again, against all the odds, he defeats the King of England in a, in a set battle in England and becomes the King of England. And that does set in train this, this extraordinary, I think, change uh, in English history and indeed in European history as well. Right. And I've had guests on this show who have also looked at this and argued different sides. Several years ago, I had a guest who talked specifically about the 1066 conquest. I think about three months ago, another guest talked about the Anglo-Saxons specifically. Now, because he was more interested on the Anglo-Saxon side, he made the argument that well, other than language, not much changed. Maybe not much changed, but the trajectory of England largely would have been similar. Now, just looking at the language issue of first, 
the change is extraordinary. Anyone who wants to read Beowulf in its original form, by all means, do so, and you'll see. And English language was much similar to the Germanic languages, Danish, Icelandic. That's how it would have sound. And then thousands and thousands and thousands of new words and vocabulary were brought in. But to address your point directly, can you describe the lead up and effects of the Norman conquest of 1066? You mentioned this before, but yeah, please go in detail. How does it change England? Because the change is dramatic. Well, at the time, what happens is that there is a, a virtual, there's a, there's a complete transfer of land. The whole of England is transferred from Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Scandinavian owners to Normans and Norman followers. So to begin with, this is the biggest transfer of land ever that we know about. And there may have been others before in, in the history of similar dimensions, but within historical times, there's nothing like it. And all that is recorded in the Doomsday Book, how one Anglo-Saxon knight or baron or lord after another is replaced by a northern French equivalent. And that is an absolute you know, takeover. It's the transposition of an aristocracy, a complete, a complete change over over 10, 15 years, all done very, very rapidly. And that sets the land ownership uh, structure of England right up to the present day. There are people who are in the House of Lords who can trace their ancestry back to the Norman Conquest or who'd, who'd, who claim to, um, who certainly would not have been in that position today uh, had they not come over or their ancestors come over with the Conqueror. So I think it sets the land holding pattern that is created as early as, as 1066. What else changes? You've mentioned the language. Yes, vast changes to the language. About 20% of English words have a French element in them in one way, way, way or another. And we won't go into details about that, but it, it, is a, it does change and they blend into English with English and eventually Middle English and Chaucer they emerge out of this mixture of the two languages and cultures. So it's a, it is a fundamental change. And that wouldn't have happened without the conquest. The other major things that happen is that the Anglo-Saxon church is taken over by the Normans, uh, both physically and personally. That is that the, all the, the new bishops and abbots archbishops there, Norman or Norman nominees, and that is a complete change. And then also they bring in this new architectural style called Romanesque, which we call Norman in England, but it is, is a big change from the rather, I, I won't say um, erratic, but it's, uh, Anglo-Saxon architecture is much more scattered in its character than Norman, which is, which is a direct relation to Roman architecture. It, it, it is reintroducing Roman architecture on a big scale. And, and that has enormous impact on, on the physical site of, it, of England. Now, you've got me on something which I'm, I'm very keen on. And the other thing is that the Normans introduced castles. There are no castles, per se, in, in England before 1066. Some Historians would say, yeah, well, there are things which you, know, you might say are castles. Well, I'm sure there are fortified buildings and so on. But castles are a different thing. They are the representation of power. They are they're, they're places where power is both exercised and demonstrated. They are the places that hold down. You can build the small castles very quickly, and they're rather like Norman Roman forts. They could penetrate behind enemy line, you build them very quickly. If they get burnt down, you replace them. And so they were, a, they were a major introduction, and they also had a major impact on, without the castles, the Normans probably wouldn't have been able to hold England. They, they might have won at Hastings, but without the castle, they wouldn't have continued their, their stranglehold on, on, on the country. So castles, and the building of castles has enormous effect on towns, for instance, if you look at somewhere like Norwich or you look, you look at Durham, half a dozen major English towns, their central geography is dictated by the presence of a castle, a cathedral, a bishop's palace, and, and the whole of the layout 
uh, we can point back immediately to the Norman and say, that is a Norman town, or, or, the, or the core of it is Norman. Is that enough? Right. <laughs> well, you make a very good point because for non-specialists or non-medievalists, they don't understand what a force multiplier a castle is, that even up to 1453 and the conquest of Constantinople, that the Ottoman army has significant trouble conquering a city with perhaps hundreds of thousands of soldiers, even though there are only about 10,000 defending it, even at a time when they have cannons and gunpowder and other things. And much has been made, rightly so, about the superiority of Islamic civilization or Chinese civilization at this time, if we're speaking about the size of cities or total power or perhaps philosophical research. But what's overlooked is that at the time, especially in the high Middle Ages, Europe has leading defensive fortification technology, and that's what, and I'm sure you'll get into, allows them to do things like create crusader states, even though they're always low on men. They're vastly outnumbered. There's only a few people defending. But uh, Europe is cutting edge at this time. So even if they might have waned in power in other areas compared to their neighbors. So um, yeah, to follow up on this with Normans, tell me about their other kingdoms that they set up outside of England in Sicily, Southern Italy, Crusader states. Uh, please tell me about how the other holdings that they have. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Well, or perhaps I could start in Britain actually and say we talk about the, the conquest of England, and it was a conquest of England and the English throne. But very rapidly, within again within decades, the Normans had penetrated into Wales on a big scale and had certainly taken South Wales, and that was under Norman control in exactly the same way a feudal system of a Norman lords um, with their manorial castles or manor houses dominating the area. And they did something similar in Scotland, although not quite as dramatically. But in Scotland, the Scots more or less copied the Normans and created a Norman type of state. Um, so eventually you get a, a Welsh state, which, is, which has a lot of Norman characteristics to it. There's still a strong Celtic element to it, but, they, but the, the Normans are in charge for all practical purposes. And in, in Scotland, there's just a sort of imitating of the Normans' means of doing things, taking over, establishing Latin dioceses, the whole panoply of control is echoed in Scotland, certainly in Scotland, south of, south of the Midlands. And that means that the, that the Norman impact is not just limited to England. And you can see beautiful Norman buildings, both in Wales and in Scotland. Also, of course, the Normans are involved in Ireland. But that is a different story. Without going down too much of, of a sort of a, a, a false alley, the people who actually took over Ireland, who invaded Ireland, were no longer, strictly speaking, Normans. They, were, they had actually, the Norman dynasty in England had, had married, intermarried with the Angevins in France, and they were, they were really a, a, sli a slightly different line. Although we always talk about the Normans in Ireland, and the Normans are much despised in Ireland because they, they looked upon as the first sort of English invasion, as it were, which changed the nature of Ireland. But really, in the people who do that are not strictly Norman. They behave like Normans, perhaps we could say that. As for the other ones, they're very different takeovers. There's this takeover of southern Italy and of Sicily, which is a much more long, protracted business than the invasion of England and the takeover of England. It takes 50 years, 70 years, because what it is, it's a piecemeal takeover. They start off as pilgrims. By which time, by the middle of the uh, 11th century, they're, they're, they're sort of very pious Christians, be it somewhat violent pious Christians, and they go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and they pass through southern Italy. And southern Italy is a bit of a mess in political terms, because it's, it's a mixture of of small city states run by Byzantines, run by Lombards, run by the Latin Church, and run by Muslims. So it's a whole mixture down there. And what they do is make themselves 
into mercenaries. They, they, they go as armed pilgrims and they turn themselves into mercenaries and they become so successful that they are able eventually after, as I say, after about 50 years, to be the main players in southern Italy, south of Naples and really up as far as Rome. And with a with Norman duchies down there, Norman Norman rulers, and this is this is a knocked on into Sicily, because Sicily is under Muslim rule. It had been taken over in the ninth century by Muslims and was still under Muslim control. And so, from about 1050, 1060, the Normans eye up Sicily. It looks like a good bet to them that the Sicilian Muslims are not that strong, not that united. And so they begin a process of attrition, a process of sending raids in and gradually winning over city after city and eventually taking Palermo. And then by the end of the 11th century, well, even before that, by the 1090s, they had control of Sicily. They, they were counts of Sicily. And then they become kings of Sicily with and, and rule both over Sicily and southern Italy. So it is a very different story, but it shows the same sort of determination and both military and, I think, strategic and political nous, which allows them to do that. So that is the takeover of that part of the world. And there's a knock on from there. They take over Malta. And there's a short term, very short term, little annexation of North Africa, part of Tunisia. That doesn't last very long, but it, the sort of Norman purists would say it was part of their empire. So that is that particular story. The other bit of the story is, of course, their involvement in the Crusades. And there are two lots of Normans who go on crusade. There's Normans from Normandy under Duke Robert who was uh, William the Conqueror's son, and Normans from Italy in particular, who also go on crusade. In two different armies, in fact. And it is the Italian army that eventually is able to take over Anatolia. Uh, not Anatolia, sorry, Antioch. They become the rulers of one of the crusader states called Antioch. And they remain. The Norman line there, which starts with Beaumont, actually lasts longer than any of the other Norman lines right through until the 13th century. But as with everywhere they went, they adopted and adapted once they got control. And they used the facilities that were there for them. They used the administrators. They used the, uh, they used the structures that were there. And in Italy, they become very very Byzantine and Italian, and in the Levant, they become very Syrian, basically. They become very Eastern and Byzantine as, as well. There are one or two other places they are involved with where they have little short-term successes. One is in Spain, where they, are, they go again as mercenaries, and they are able to establish a quite a short-lived Norman state in the middle of Spain during the whole of the reconquest of Spain. That again doesn't take uh, last very long. The Spaniards are much more, much better organised than the Italians in protecting their own land as they as they reclaim it. And they also take a short-lived enclave in the, right in the middle Byzantine Anatolia, Anatolia at a time when the Byzantines are fighting the Ottomans. So those are that gives you some sort of spread of their interests. And they also had their, they had their eyes on Byzantium, and certainly the, the Norman kings of Italy and Sicily would have readily taken over Byzantium. Roger I, who is the first king of Sicily and Italy, dresses in Byzantine imperial clothing, as it were, almost like, like, a, like a sort of anticipation of what he's going to be, what he's going to do. So you can see they were ambitious and they were effective. But they were not long-lived in the sense that the Normans, there's too few of them really to take over in a folk way like the Anglo-Saxons did. And so eventually they are absorbed, but they change what they find. And they change all of those places quite dramatically, not perhaps so much in, in the Levant, but uh, certainly in Italy and Sicily. Well, this is a good way to explore a topic I've come across a lot on this show, 
And that's really the complexity of the Middle Ages, that there's still a lingering sense of superstition and intolerance with Things like the Crusades or the Reconquista. And I, as you mentioned, the Crusades are, there was a lot of, there was religious combat, of course, but then also a lot of cooperation as well. And finding out ways to create a government with uh, a heterogeneous population. And the Normans, as you said, are also very interesting because, on the one hand, they're famous adventurers, mercenaries, they can be warlike, but they're also creating unique government. So, in the case of Sicily, the Normans are taking over the administration from Arabs, Byzantines, Lombards, combining it with feudal law. Some have said that they granted great religious freedom. And there's even a book about Roger called, <laughs> I love the name of this, uh, Kitab Rujaja in Arabic, the book of a Roger. So what would, I mean, how would you characterize the Normans, I suppose? I mean, the word tolerance, it, it has... It can be a little bit twisted in our 21st century conception of the term, and nobody in the Middle Ages was tolerant the way that we use the word today on the Christian or the Muslim side, but how would you characterize the Normans if you could do so? Well, I, I would say that, I mean, they were incredibly, incredibly eclectic. As you say, they start off as real bullies and violent looters and raiders in all, all the circumstances, not just the takeover of Normandy, but they adapt very quickly. They, they take over and they absorb the, the, the strengths of the area they're in. But they're dynastic, more than colonial, really. I mean, we look at them in a colonial way, but I think they're more dynastic. They're more interested in their families and marrying their families. And if they're married, if their families had to marry into a sort of, uh, let's say, not so much Muslim, which is very rare, but certainly Byzantine, or if they had to bar bar into Italian families or Anglo-Saxon families, then they would do it because it was part of the, you know, part of the survival mechanism. But they were interested in land and territory within a dynastic framework rather than the Normans. And they, they probably, although there were links between Normandy and Sicily, and, and, and lots of historians go out of their way to try to embellish them, and indeed, there are sort of marital links between the French, between the um, Sicilian monarchy and the English monarchy. Well, this is an aside, and we can return back to your point. With a uh... The, there's two interesting things in England, at least, with the Norman line. One is, as you said, they didn't speak English, and then the new French-English hybrid emerges with Chaucer a few centuries later. But I think it's for a few centuries that English kings don't speak English. That includes Richard the Lionheart. So it's sort of like the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt that speaks Greek. It doesn't speak the regional language until Cleopatra comes along centuries later. So, and if I understand correctly, and um, much of the, the mythos of King Arthur comes from France, is that transmitted by the Normans or is that something that comes later? I think what you get, you get, you get with, with Arthur, you get the um, Robert Wace and one or two others who are writing, who are bringing in ideas from France, which mingle with uh, often the Celtic ideas in this country, Celtic stories, and, and Arthur emerges from that. <laughs> it's a good question. Would Arthur have arisen without the Norman, <laughs> without the Normans? Because <laughs> the um, uh, the English kings a bit later start looking back on Arthur as a sort of uh, a true non-Norman, as it were. But anyway, that's another story. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's interesting because I read that J.R.R. Tolkien, part of his interest in creating his legendarium in the Lord of the Rings, is he wanted to have a national myth for England. And some would say, well, what about the King Arthur legend? Doesn't that suffice? And he thought that it was entirely too French to be a proper English national myth. So that's an interesting point. He wasn't, wasn't a huge fan of French culture, but had to learn what he could as a scholar and a historian. Sorry, sorry can I just go back to the, the, this French, the French business, the French language? One of the reasons why it survives so long is, of course, because... England, through Normandy and through then the next dynasty that, that brings in the Angevins, brings in Gascony, and the whole of Western France, in fact, comes under the control of an English king, or what's called an English king, but he's, but he's a, as you say, he's a French-speaking English king who has more interest in France than he does in England, because he's got a bigger, he's got an enormous chunk of France. But the French... Really, the, the, the French 
continuum, it goes through the Angevin line. If it had finished with, let's say, with Stephen and you'd, I don't know, I don't know, let's say you'd got a, a compromise king coming in afterwards, then it would probably have reverted more to English. But with with Henry II and his his sort of European interests, it is it is essentially a, an Anglo-French or a, a Franco-English empire that they've got. And they've got as much interest in France as they have in England, if not more. And that that creates <laughs> the, the English obsession with France right up to Queen Elizabeth and beyond, and the feeling that you no know, big parts of France belong to England. But of course they don't. It was all part of this medieval mix of dynastic ownership that brought France into England. It was the other way around to begin with. And then it, it changes changes sides as nationalism grows, as France grows, and as England grows as a, a sort of nationalistic country. Which England came close to conquering France in the Hundred Years' War. So be careful who you colonize, because they might colonize you right back after a while. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, before uh, looking sort of at the end of the story for the Normans, one question I have is, what did it mean to identify as Norman? Now, on the one hand, you have someone in, as part of a royal dynasty who could be in the line of William and say, I'm part of this Norman line. But if you were a Norman in Sicily, if you were a Norman adventurer, was it an ethnic identity? Was it a culture? Did it? What did it mean to say, I am a Norman at this time? Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Well, it probably meant much less if you were on crusade, for instance, because the crusaders were all, as you probably know, were all called Franks by the by the Muslims, and they were all put together. And in Sicily and in Italy, they they intermarried with enormous rapidity in order to secure their place. So uh, being a Norman would probably be of for pride for a couple of generations, but you would then take on another identity, which you would be sort of Norman, Italian or whatever. And I think by certainly by the 13th century, that would not have been of particular interest because by which time Sicily was in other, other hands politically altogether. But there would have been, you know, there were Norman, uh, I don't think that I mean, there are great Norman buildings in Sicily and southern and southern Italy. Um, so there would have been a certain pride there, and a certain pride that you get in England, of course. So say, uh, I, of course, I came over with the Conqueror. You hear people say, or my grandfather came over with the Conqueror. But by 1200, you're getting the division because as as Normandy disappears, you see, one thing we haven't touched upon: Normandy itself is absorbed by France in 1204. And therefore, that's the end of Normandy. It never, it doesn't reemerge except in under sort of English control late, later on. But Normandy as a political entity and, uh, and a cultural entity is over by 1204. And as France develops as a much stronger political entity, then the English have to decide whether their allegiances are with France or whether they're with England. And you get this, then you get this moving apart of the English and the um, and the French. Even so, even that the, the court was still speaking French in England. Well, speaking of the end of their story, you mentioned that they disappear from world affairs by the mid 13th century. So why do they disappear? Is it merely the absorption of Normandy, even though there's a Norman identity that exists and there are dynasties that exist elsewhere? So number one, why did they exist? And number two, you mentioned that they left behind a permanent cultural and political legacy. So what was this legacy they left behind, even though they disappeared as a political entity? Well, I think I can talk best about England uh, or, or Britain. And they, the Normans impose a, a feudal system. I mean, again, there's lots of argument about that, as you probably know. But they, and that feudal system is embedded in ownership, um, culture, structure, society. And that, that survives well into the 20th century. And some people say it survives today. And I think that that's 
I believe that that is, I mean, it may not be one of their greatest bequests to society, but I think it is one of the, the biggest things that they did was to create a, a, a hierarchical society which continued. And you say that, I mean, England has this the class system which adapts a bit like the Normans as different things come along. But I think that is one of their biggest contributions. I think their second biggest contribution was in the landscape. They, they changed the English landscape forever, both in, in, in specific towns and villages, but also in the architecture. They created an architecture which is still harked after, goes back to its neo-Romanesque, not so much at the present, but it'll come back. So I think they, made, they left an enormous contribution in that point of view. The language and the, the literature that evolves in the 12th century, the Anglo-Norman, owes a vast amount, not so much to Normandy itself, but to France. And it's brought, it, it is the Normans that bring that together and give rise to Anglo-Norman literature, I think. And to close things out, tell me if I'm correct or not, but I believe I've read that William has everyone in a European royal family is a direct descendant of William based on how royal intermarriage works. I believe I read that every single American president is a descendant of him and something like 50 million residents or so, or 50 million descendants just in the United States and perhaps hundreds of millions around the world. So I don't know if that sounds right, but based on what you've read, does that seem plausible? Yes. I mean, I, th I think the problem with tracing your lineage back is, of course, you get to a certain stage when it just just it's just sort of multiplies to the point where you can't get control of it. So I think I suspect I'm linked to <laughs> William as well, <laughs> but I don't boast about it. <laughs> but the but I think I'm sure that the, the Norman roots go right. You know, they they, they cut across right the world. Well, you, and you've also got a lot of, you've got a lot of French names in. Norman names in, in uh, America as well, isn't you? Uh, Montgomery, which French is a is a is a pure Norman conquest name. Roger de Montgomery was one of William's big sidekicks, and that name we have in in this country, but you have it, you have several of them, I think, in America. Very much many town names, the store Montgomery Ward. So with the uh, profligacy of William and his descendants, I guess there's a little bit of Norman in all of us, you could say. Well. There's a lot more in this story, and for listeners who want to check it out, the name of the book is The Normans, A History of Conquest. Trevor, thank you for joining us. Not at all. Thank you, Scott. Bye-bye. That is all for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to help support the show, there are some easy ways to do it. First of all, please like and subscribe to it on the podcast player of your choice because this helps the show grow. Second, you can get show notes, subscribe to the newsletter for History Unplugged, and also other great podcasts that are part of the Parthenon Podcast Network, including Key Battles of American History and Beyond the Big Screen at ParthenonPodcast.com 